All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Dr. Corey Welch comes to us from Iowa State University, where he serves as the director of the STEM Scholars Program. Corey, a first-generation student and member of the Northern Cheyenne, received a bachelor's in biology at Lewis and Clark College, a master's in EEB at the University of Kansas, and a PhD in zoology at the University of Washington. His research focused on demographic and genetic patterns, as well as behavior in mice and in gophers. Prior to his current position, Corey served as an NIH Bridge Program Coordinator to train and recruit Haskell Indian Nation University students in the University of Kansas labs. And then uh, he served as the Research Program Coordinator for UC Berkeley's Biology Scholars Program. He's served on the board of directors for SACNIS, spoke at the March for Science in 2018, and we're lucky to have him here today, so please join me in welcoming Corey. Thank you. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, good. Um, yeah. So the March for Science, I got heckled for the first time by a Christian fundamentalist, which was lovely. So I didn't think of in the moment the great line of clearly our STEM education failed this individual kind of thing, but that, you know, it's the first time I've been heckled. Hopefully I won't get heckled today, but we'll cross that bridge if we need to. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me. Thank you to the grad students for the invitation. Um, I'll just, I talk tend to fast, so ask questions as, as we go, and hopefully I have a lot of slides, but I kind of skimmed through some stuff, so it may seem a little bit of a blur, but feel free to, to raise a hand. So, and let's get that working. Okay, so this is kind of a general, it's a little dated, but you can see that we don't have a huge number of underrepresented minorities getting uh, degrees in the science and engineering STEM fields. If you, go, if you want just to show you some Native American data, basically we get 70 in science and engineering, and it's been flat for the whole time. So 2008 was our big year, my year, we had 20. I probably is the only evolutionary biologist that I know of in this window. That's pathetic on a lot of different levels, but a conversation for another day. So I want to talk today a little bit about my career goal, my ISU position, because this particularly is unusual, and so grad students, I think my kind of position could be replicated and expanded in a lot of places. Um, and it serves a pretty, I think I, I have a unique skill set that becomes pretty valuable in different settings. So uh, that's the trailer park I grew up. That was back when I could do field work and was fit and strong. I had a little bit of hair hanging on last minute teaching at Haskell Indian Nations University. A Berkeley group that we took to the Hastings Field Station that this program continues to this day. I won't have time to talk about that one, but that's something I could talk about. And then having family around your research is an important part of the program. So my roots as a biologist kind of tie to a pretty common thing in Indian country, which is um, a phrase my grandfather would say, is why are we going down this road? See what we can see. And uh, that's my grandfather there. There's me with a gopher. And that's my great-great-grandmother. And there's the Northern Shiners. I grew up in Billings, so I was the city kid. Um, but um, this paying attention to nature is something I still do to this day. And when I finally got to Lewis and Clark College and taking biology classes, the professors were like impressed with how much I was into seeing stuff in the field. I had spent my 10,000 hours, if you want to use that garbage analogy, paying attention to nature. And so I'm spotting kestrels and everything on the side of the road, gopher mounds. I just can't turn it off even now. Um, and I haven't done research in 10 years. So. Things like this I got to see on the Indian Reservation. So eagle catching sites. So you lay down in there, put a bow over, dead rabbit. And it, this doesn't give you a sense, but you can see 360 around there. And then you can, when the eagle lands, you grab the eagle. That's how eagle feathers were caught back in the day. Yeah, explain that to Ayukok and you're going to have a nightmare ahead of you. <laughs> um, so these are some of the animals and plants that have been, or animals, I should say that I've been able to work with. Um, I did honeybee research as an undergrad. I got to work on uh, grasshopper mice and some parental care activities, and I did field ecology, mark recapture stuff, and habitat fragmentation. And then I've been able to do some uh, speciation biogeography things at University of Washington and during my postdoc. 
So my career now has been transitioned for about nine years is to diversify who succeeds in the sciences. Um, and so these are some of the folks I've worked with over the years, current and past. Um, this is our most recent cohort from the fall. For the, uh, I guess we'd have a spring cohort. But So what do I do? I direct this undergrad program. I co-advise the Sockness chapter, and, and we didn't have much of a presence nationally, and we've built that up. So Iowa State now had 25 faculty and staff and students at the last two Sockness conferences. From, a, from my first year, they had three. So all it took was some people motivating some people and showing some rewards. Um, I do write grants, um, so I do have PI status if I want to, if I can get a grant accepted, go for two, keep driving. Um, I teach a, a class every semester. It's one of the only requirements in my program as a freshman sophomore to take this class, and it's focused on understanding the hidden curriculum of, for first-gen low-income and minority students, of how do you get into research, What's the motivation of R1 faculty? How is papers and research funded? Those kinds of things. And then learning a little bit, so they come away with some tools like personal statements and CV resume kind of things. So just very practical, easy one credit class. But we want to demystify and understand some of the structural inequities that are going to be part of their experience at Iowa State and nationally. I do help do some leadership things with Sockness at the AAAS. Um, and I went through that program in 2012, and it transformed my career. I had, this is my first administrative title with no power. It was like a big day. So um, I have helped get rid of the GRE in a couple places. So that's been a little mini thing like that. Um, I don't do a ton with that, this position, but that's kind of that. I won't talk much about it, but there's a University of Kansas Sockness chapter in the Iowa State Sockness Prep. I do a grant writing GRFP focused but beyond that workshop where we host each other every other year. And so that's been kind of a fun uh, weekend every year. Um, there are two Native Americans enrolled as staff at Iowa State, and that is it. We have American Indian Studies program, all white people, faculty. It's OK. It's not the deal breaker, but it's, it says something about their ability to attract. And that had been on the board of directors. So enough about that. So just so we're all on the same page, who are we talking about underrepresented? I use a broad definition. You can see some are supported by and not supported by NIH or NSF grants at this time, but that may change. But you know, I've got friends that have been Asian American mammologists and had to deal with who did your field work for you, even though they've been a field work, they worked you know, at UC Berkeley and were a crazy field biologist. And so that kind of drove them out of the field. Like, this isn't a community for me if I have to keep explaining that I did this kind of work. And so I use this broad definition about who I work with. So this is the national thing that we're dealing with, is we lose a huge number of students after the first year that want to do STEM. There's a significant achievement gap at all areas, at all levels. And if you go, well, is the same interest the same? This interest is the same across groups. Everybody wants the same amount of science at this point, so you can't make that argument. It's a little harder if you want to talk about ecology and evolution more specifically, but I think that's an easy, solvable, solvable thing we can discuss. And I'll just argue that how we train students fail to deal with tradition, just some really basic things that we could solve. And if we made these changes in how we train students, my position would not need exist. And that's all of that I'm saying isn't just a good feel thing. This is based on social science and STEM education research. So I still view myself as a scientist, and if you show me the GRE is a great predictor of tests, then I will train my students to take that stupid test. But we're not, you know, that's what I view this as. So, um, and the reality is, is our major minority be becoming majority, so are you going to tell me you're ready with your faculty representation for that freshman class in seven years? They're fifth graders right now. In a lot of states, it's already flipped. So we have to adapt and get better about how we're going to serve our populations, particularly as a state school. This has to be a priority for you. I realize you're at a, we're kind of a weird state school here, but we're still a state school. There's plenty of data on this, and this is a, an article that came out. And then I just throw this as my little soapbox thing. If you're native, in the sciences or any other kind of data, typically, 
you're either at 1% or less than 1%, and they can figure out who you are of who got the PhD that year. And so you get nullified out, or you get Windsorized, the old stats uh, line, out of existence. So you oftentimes, I, as I, somebody who's active on this socially, um, I see other minority groups often forgetting about natives. And so this is kind of a pet peeve, but also this, this is a problem um, that we have to kind of get beyond. So how is Michigan doing with their undergraduates? Here's your state population of minorities. Here's your URM freshman populations. Here's your low-income populations. That just jumped up in the last couple of years. And your peer university schools. So you're doing a bit of skim here. I just saw this on Twitter two days ago. So I just thought an interesting observation. And I realize there's been some important court cases around affirmative action in this state, in this university in particular. So I understand that, but you also have to realize this is some of the realities some people are thinking about. So 1970, they were hoping for 10%. Yeah. Now I'm going to show you some data that I haven't been able to get clean numbers off easily. Um, this was a little unusual for most places. I can usually get this info pretty easily. This is so, I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. The big take home is Pell Grant low income populations in Europe tend to have lower. Okay. And then the next point is, and I'm using the University of Kansas as an example here, where how you could reach parity is re retaining 72 more freshmen in their first year retention. It's a small number. My program has 116 students in it. All right? You could solve this pretty easily. And I'm just doing the science majors. I'm not doing across the campus. So this is a solvable situation. Just to give you a sense where Iowa State is, we're pretty good on retention. Obviously, you guys are kicking ass on that front and they're national, um, but we still have an achievement gap in these different years out. And if you're that low, I'm not quite sure how you get 30% higher in two years. That generally is jumping a little higher, so that's why I don't think the numbers are legit. But there isn't a one-stop shop that I can do these numbers from for Michigan at this point. So I would argue you guys are doing a little bit of a kind of the talent to TED skimming, which we've been doing for about 50 years. And you may or not you're serving Michigan population, that's, you guys have to decide that as an institution and as a, uh, as a state. And that's, obviously that's beyond an EEB department, so I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so why are we failing to diversify EEB and STEM fields in general? Lack of role models has been the classic and it holds true. Scott Edwards, I met at the Sockness Conference and that was my first PhD advisor, so I was co-advised by Scott. Um, and you're asking people to be a minority within a minority within a minority. That's a tough thing to ask of when you're the first person in your family to go to college. Um, this just was from a couple of days ago, an article, brief blog post about the early five or six African Americans doing evolutionary biology. And there's a paper that came out as well around that time. So we have tr traditional uh, institutional barriers Stereotype threat, imposter syndrome, I assume everybody knows what those terms are. Um, imposter syndrome is me wanting to run out of this room right now. Um, so there's aspects of that. High school GPA and SAT are not good predictors of success. This was a big thing at Berkeley that happened before I got there, but if your high school didn't have AP chemistry, your ability to get an A or a B in intro chemistry at Berkeley was 10% and you had a 50% chance of getting a D, F, or a withdraw. And so we had to create the Biology Scholars Program, the program I'm ripping off, which I'll get into later, um, created a, a pre-chem course, a two-credit class to solve this problem. And then the university then matched and created this as well. I don't know if this is a barrier here in this state or in other places in the country, but this is something we need to think about. You guys have already dropped the GRE, so I won't belabor the point on that section. How many of you know this and know the studies by Kate Clancy's Clank group? Hands up high, I want to just kind of see. Yeah, so not that many. How many of you do field work? A lot more, okay. Do you guys have a plan if you get bit by a snake or a vehicle breaks down? Yeah, why don't you have a reporting line for sexual assault, sexual harassment in the field? This has to be part of your fieldwork preparation and training for all students to understand the power dynamics in play. And the rates of abuse are shocking if you were to read those papers. 
And I won't talk about implicit bias here. Another big factor is cultural relevancy has to align for underrepresented populations. So sacrificing giving back to your community is more likely to be in underrepresented folks. Socioeconomic and cultural status is another part of this, so expectations of your family and community. Me telling my mom I want to study pocket gopher systematics. It's a little harder sell than how about work on diabetes or something that we really need in Indian country or cancer. So those are big challenges. Um, and then we have to acknowledge, particularly for natural history museums and other things that we do biologically in our labs and things, is sometimes there's cultural things that just don't align. So for some tribes, touching dead animals is taboo. And so how do you work around it? There's ways to work around that with Diné and Hopi people. We've got past sins of anthropology. If you don't know this, genomics misuse by Arizona State Teresa Markoff's group. Um, that happened right as I finished my PhD. A little population genesis native guy wanting to go work in tribal communities, and I have to answer to this shit. Sorry, language, but this has been a big challenge. And so the nice thing that's happened in the last five years, there is a summer internship in native genomics group that started out of Illinois by all very young native geneticists and genome experts. And now they have summer programs here in the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand working with indigenous folks. And they've published a series of papers. I don't have time to talk about them in any detail here on how to effectively work with native populations and native genomics. So we don't have a uh, Elizabeth Warren situation in the same sense, okay? I still like her as a politician. She screwed up big. I can get into that a whole nother level. But we have to deal with these, the reality of our history of our, our programs. Limited professional network and time with faculty. Students are more likely to hold down a job um, while they're, and they're less likely to talk to you. A little longer to the BABS. Uh, volunteering in a lab is a huge issue for my students. I had a student get into an amazing REU to work on Kirkland's Warbler up here in Michigan. And she was going out in the field to sit in sweaty, muggy, tick, chigger land in blue jeans. So how do I pay for her to get hiking boots and field pants and give her some other, you know, how to go to a co how to go to the, get cheap shirts from different places and things like that. That has to be part of your budgets when you guys are writing grants. 200 bucks can transform my students' experience doing field work. Hiking boots are a huge thing. Um, pop culture, there's a field work and nature. Um, Anytime people go on a on a TV show, they go out in nature, what happens? An animal attacks, or there's a scary situation. We have lynching culture, obviously, still be an issue. Nature is scary. And if you're Latinx and your family sacrifice and they're working in the fields, they want to send you back out in the field? Again, cultural conversation, you're gonna to have to get over the barrier of your family supporting you so you can pursue these things that you, because you're a passionate kid that wants to work on whatever out in nature. All right. So how do we think about undergraduate recruitment and selection? How many of you guys are familiar with the movie or the book Moneyball? Yeah, it's a, it's a little sports analogy, but I'll, the, the lessons of Moneyball is basically how do we evaluate talent? And so in sports, for baseball, they would spend a billion dollars. The New York Yankees will buy the best players. And if you're a lower funded team, you have to find other ways. And so I think you can use the same analogy for higher education. And the two lessons from Moneyball are the failure of traditional measures of success, our traditional metrics, and finding undervalued talent. And that's our first STEM scholar graduate there. Um, so what are the things I care about? I want to know the history behind your grades and your scores and your, how you ended up here at Iowa State. That tells me a lot about how I can work with you more effectively. Can I quantify passion for biology? This is a gut feeling, but I make students write about it in an application and then interview about it. And it's, again, it's a gut feel hearing them talk nerdily about gophers or whatever that might be. 
course, no one says gophers, but I'm still hoping one day. Um, distance traveled. So if you're from Oakland and you made it to Berkeley, that's two miles as the crow flies, but depending on your neighborhood in Oakland, that could be a million miles. My mom getting from Lame Deer, Montana to Billings is 100 miles. Again, a generational leap in educational opportunities for her kids. So those are things I want to know about for a student that showed up in front of me. Because I know if they're in front of me, that means they survived a structure or our society that wasn't built for them. And that tends to be a creative problem solver. And it also means they've navigated some barriers. And so that's a doctor I want to have. It's a scientist I want to have. It's a vet I want to have. And then can we assess what are the cultural barriers facing that individual student versus the institution? And so I'm figuring out, well, I got a pretty good sense of what the institutional barriers are at Iowa State now. When I was first there, I didn't. We had to kind of figure that out for the students. So this is the undergraduate training program. It's ripping off John Matsui's program at UC Berkeley. We did a Wordle with the students, and I think that tells you a lot about what we're shooting for within the STEM scholars. Um, it's a focused on developing talent, not skimming talent. And so we work with where the student is and go from there. It's a four-year-plus learning community. Iowa State's big on learning communities for freshmen. It's usually a one-semester shared class around your major. Maybe you live together. Um, but our membership is for life, or until they tell me they don't want to belong. It's open to all students, but it focuses on underrepresented folks. The two things I'm looking for in an application, and if they read closely on the website, which is not a good website, but it still has all the information, these are the two things I'm looking for. It's passion for science. Do they have a history of giving help? And for, particularly for minority populations, giving help is cultural value. So, Because it's a peer-to-peer -peer sharing of what you know. So those freshmen that are sophomore, junior that end up doing an REU or go off to a Chappep pre-med program, they come back and do a workshop on that very thing. They don't need to hear me lecturing at them all the time. Mostly incoming freshmen, some transfers. I already talked about this class, so I'll leave that there. We have 10 program alumni at this point. We'll have about 15 more probably graduating in May, and we're building our future resources. And I will con continue to apply for grants. All right. So what do we do? Some monthly workshops. So we bring in postdocs or friends that we have. We do this grant writing workshop. We do kind of cheesy things like that. This is all a student-run workshop every year. So alumni started with Princess, and now we have four alumni of the Chappep program. Chappep's this really cool pre-med, pre-dental, pre-health career summer internship. One application, about 14 schools, crazy competitive. Um, so I wrote nine letters of rec for Chappep this in the last two weeks. And fingers crossed we'll be kicking ass if we get two or three. That's the goal. Um, bring in faculty of color or other folks that I know in my network. The ones that circle in red are ecology evolution folks. Um, and I'm really excited, Krishnell, and I've worked with Tyrone at Berkeley a bunch. And, um, and some of these folks I've known really well, like Danielle Lee, Judy Simcox. And we went to grad school together. So. There's a good mammologist if you just want to bring kick the tires from. He's at Ohio State. Ohio State. Sorry, uh, UMass. Sorry, Madison. Madison, Ohio State. So. All right. Where are we at with numbers? 114. You can see we're heavily skewed towards females. That is the pattern with these kind of programs across the country. Men don't apply. And then also, we're losing a lot of men of color through the criminal justice system before they even get to college. Um, you can see the URM versus the poll population we're pulling from, first gen and Pell. And those are our numbers. We're across multiple colleges. We got students struggling. We got students crushing it and all things in between. Other factoids I wanted to test last spring am I skimming students? Am I unconsciously picking really strong students? And as for high school GPA, I am. I am picking high. I didn't realize that. My ACT scores are a little lower than the average, and that's continued with this year. Um, one thing I point out is about a quarter of my students, both parents, the highest level of education is greater middle school. Um, a lot of my students both are first gen, both parents. And then a lot of my students, like myself, have a bad quarter or a bad semester. I got a one eight one quarter. Um, and there's a story behind that, but that's a story for another day. 
Um, where we're at is we write lots of letters rec and make my students apply to a lot of stuff. So I have submitted 72 letters of rec in the last three weeks. I've got 22 in the queue. Only a couple are due this week. Um, about 25 to 30 students applying to these different things. And so we want them to apply. We want my students to be comfortable with rejection so that they're throwing themselves out there. Uh, we have paid, paid tutors for the intro bio through the OCAM series. And our, we got our first PhD at, in the EEB program, the first PhD at Yale University. Um, that one right there. Juan's in Guam doing field work, uh, lab manager, uh, applying to grad programs, masters, and we'll be applying to a PhD soon. So um, goal is to close that achievement gap get them in position with a 3.0 so that they're open for these other kinds of programs and opportunities post grad. I want the reputation, this is a good program for research students within Iowa State or nationally. This program could easily go to 1,000 students. The 250 is what I pitched originally to Iowa State. Um, but there's 500 minorities just within the biological sciences alone. So you could see how we're not even talking first gen low income. And the goal is to create students that are ready for a world without a STEM scholar, and that they've done enough of these workshops that they can create their own infrastructure at wherever they're at, in the private sector or at another university. And you guys could rip me off, and that'd be cool. There's about 12 programs that are modeled after the Berkeley program. All right, any questions about the undergrad program before I transfer on? Okay. So, sorry I made fun of the grad, stinky grad student, but that's... Um, what are our recruitment? It's a traditional thing. Look around this room. And you guys are relatively diverse for an EEB program. This is the ninth EEB program I've given this talk to. So we have SEEDS at ESA. You got the undergraduate diversity program at SSE and SSB. And then I, I'm sure SICB has something similar of some sort. Um, Places you could be finding students. How many of you have been to a Sockness conference? One, two, three, four, yeah. How many have been to Abercams? A few more, yeah, okay. So Abercams is almost strictly biomedical, um, but it's a fantastic national conference. I drank the Kool-Aid on Sockness because that's where I met Scott Edwards. And, um, and when I first tried to go to ACES, which is American Indian Science and Engineering, sorry, it's still pretty engineering and job fair. Like, there's not a lot of research there. But hopefully that'll change over the next few decades. But Sockness is the place to be, in my opinion, if you want to go across STEM fields and across uh, ethnic, multi-ethnic groups. And you can see who attended last year's conference in Hawaii. You can see that there's white, there's African American, there's Asian. I've taken all my students from all groups to this conference. Uh, you see disciplines represented here. Um, when I first associated with it, I was the only ecologist I met the first time I went to Sockness. Um, now there's a fair number. We're not huge, but it's still a biomedical focused, cell biology focused conference on that front. So what can you do as an individual within your scientific societies or as a group, is you can submit, you pay for a booth, you guys are already at this conference as a university. But you could do a, literally an EEB specific booth if you wanted to do something like that, or partner with your scientific society. You could also sponsor a workshop and then fill it with your EEB related speakers. Or you can just propose a session period and worry about how you're gonna get people there anyways. So there's lots of different ways you can attack this. Typically, there's probably two ecology evolution workshops. Would you think that's about right, folks? You've been, yeah. Right now, there's an overrepresentation of faculty that go, and not enough students. So our scientific societies that you guys are part of are not sending students to this conference. Um, you always already have a chapter that's thriving with 50 students. I didn't know you had 50. That's crazy big for five years in. You guys are crushing it, for those of you in the audience. And I did put your mug in the front here, um, as was asked. Here's some of my students over the last two years. Um, a couple of them went 
both years, but uh, yeah. So these are some folks that have been at the conference presenting research. And like I said, there's these scientific sessions and some folks there. Okay, there's travel awards. Um, most of your institutions are there. If you want to hang out with a program officer, they're going to be there. Um, the scientific societies themselves are not really present in any serious way. Um, and then there's travel awards for grad students to go present there or undergrads. Um, and if you want to pick my brain, there's easy ways. I got paid to go to that conference as a grad student because I worked at the university booth so many times. There's ways you can kind of work around this to get the 1200 bucks basically that you would need to go to this conference. Um, and I tell people, expect low recruitment. I got the engineering department to sponsor one of the poster student awards for best engineering poster. And then took a photo and they were blissed out. Okay. It's an easy 250 for them, but it's transformative for that student potentially. And it, it's those little things like that that you can do to do that. So let's talk about grad selection. I'll show you one cute animal. Not very well adapted to the lack of snow, though. So bye-bye, Ehrman. OK. I'm going to just show you that there's all this GRE data. You guys have already dropped the GRE, so I won't belabor the point, OK? So I'm just going to move through all these slides. But basically, other folks, when I'm trying to convince, this is what I throw at them. Um, and then the ETS occasionally decides to get ratioed for trying to defend the GRE, which is kind of funny. All right. so. We haven't really talked, we talked about recruitment and selection, we really haven't talked about inclusion, the actual environment you're putting underrepresented populations here at, at, at your university or your department. So I just love this quote, and she just announced she's new faculty this fall, so it's a good Twitter follow if you don't, Ambika. And I may have said her name wrong, um, but yes. So. Think about these grad school applications. Are you collecting demographic data, first-gen low-income status in your grad applications? My university isn't, which is dumb. But you know, they say, well, it's really expensive to change an application. It's like, oh, really? It's electronic. <laughs> this, is, this is a, you know, so I, I fight the fights where I can fight, but that's, yeah. So obviously a little F, people still do F statistics. I'm a little out of date when it comes to pop gen at this point. All right, so um, if you want to see the complete list of the 300 programs that have dropped the GRE, that's Josh Hall uh, maintains this list and has published papers on the effect, ineffectiveness of the GRE. Here's your 25 EEB or EOB programs. These were the new ones with a couple of programs added. Since I gave this talk in October, these nine ones are new. So you can see this is a trend. I don't know how you feel about that. You guys have a couple, when did you drop the GRE? How many years ago? Yeah. Just one year? This is our second it's your second cycle, okay. So you can, you're still collecting data on, are you doing okay with this process? And that's kind of my take home on this, which is we're doing an ongoing ex experiment on grad selection. So we know what is not informative. We know kind of the structural things it causes for barriers for students. So if you think you're like, look, it's the quantitative, it's the quantitative, well then show the data that why the quantitative works for your lab in particular maybe. Um, your sample size is gonna suck, but I mean you can still make the argument. And so we have to kind of be open-minded to this process and all these things that I'm talking about. You, you all are willing to adapt to new technologies that have come down and how we do genome and statistical analyses, and you need to do the same thing in this other area. Here's a holistic scoring model that keeps the GRE, but downweights it, but there's a way, so this is modified from a, a, bio, a biomedical study of composite scoring. So there's ways that you can kind of add things like this. My wife does a version of this for her own selection. Just what her criteria, what she thinks is the best fit for her before she meets us with the student. But, you know, I think you just need to think about how you might want to approach this. One thing for grad students is we definitely need to add in a career development time piece. You've got grad students for between five and seven years. Average is probably six, I would guess. No departments don't like to always say that. It's five years. So, you know, right. If you're doing field work, it's going to be six. 
It just is. I mean, the first field season tends to be a mess anyways, as you're learning your system. Um, but there's a misalignment, so when people are doing career development, which is at the postdoc level, versus when you should be doing it, which is in grad school. And I've had a lot of Berkeley students and one Iowa State grad student come to me and say, I want to learn about your job or these other kind of careers, but I'm afraid to tell my graduate committee or my PI because they're not going to think I'm as serious about science. And Kenny Gibbs' research came out shortly after this, and that was just lovely to have this kind of, because I was getting this anecdotal thing, and I was like, oh, yeah. I mean, you grad students are swimming with sharks. You're in an elite EEB program. You get a lot of maniacs around you. Some of you are the maniac. And so understand that. And so this has got to be, we got to require all grad students to have maybe two, three months doing shadowing a biotech community college teacher, shadowing my job or some version of that, or a policy postdoc, or what are these other kind of policy careers, or NGOs. We have to get a little more flexible about how we're doing this because how many of you are actually going to end up in tenure track positions? All right? And so in the biomedical sciences, there's about 12% of PhDs are going to end up in an R1 research set. So that's not a lot. What are we doing with the other 88%? Okay, so let's talk about faculty. Um, because I'm a maniac on these kind of issues, I went ahead and looked at the number of females in the photo, if I'm generalizing. Not good, so Gary Larson's coming back as well. I don't know if any of you are into Gary Larson. It shows my age and the old faculty nodding their head behind me. All right, so where are you guys at as faculty? You've got 33 tenure track, and thank you for the, the, the data. Um, I didn't include international faculty of color because they didn't grow up in a minoritized setting. They were majority in their communities. And it's not quite the same as a US born minority student or, or kid. And so that doesn't mean they aren't going to deal with BS, with being a, a Latino or Lat Latinx or Lat Latina in our field and are here in the US. But it's not the same, it's not apples apples comparison. I've yet to see an EEB department that was over 40%, so you guys are right at the cusp, congratulations. You're still 11% short, that's not cool. And then relatively, you have one of the most, the only department that I've been that has a higher number of minority tenure track faculty is Ohio State University. Um, and but they have a terrible gender issue, but that's a whole other thing. So, so, to each their own. But I just want to give you guys a sense. For EEB, you're doing all right, relatively. But you have a lot of growth to do in all of these fields. Um, your numbers reflect what you value. And I realize departments evolve and change and move. I mean, animal behavior was a big thing when I started grad school in the 90s. Behavioral ecology was a thing big time. And there's still behavioral ecologists around, but those jobs are not coming as often or they've relabeled them as something else. Doesn't mean people start doing behavioral ecology, but it's just that title's changed a fair bit. So what does your department look like five to 10 years out? Who's retiring? What holes do you need to fill? What are your priorities as a department? You as faculty need to have that fight, argue those arguments and make a case for why we need a community colleges desperately. Okay, well then why can't that be a woman or a person of color? Then start beating the brush and finding those folks out there to then hire. And so this is things to think about, and I'd obviously am, you know, here poking you guys a little bit. This is something to think about. And I realize I said gendered language, you guys, but I'm working on it. Anyways. So, here's my summary thoughts. I've been on NSF and NIH panels where people say, we'll advertise to URM students. You, you don't have a plan. You don't have any receipts of you doing this work. So you better have a detailed plan for your recruitment at all levels. Um, document your past, present student demographic data. How many of you grad students have worked with undergrads? Do you know if they're first gen low income? That's stuff you can find out if you have a relationship with these students. Applies to you faculty as well. Do the history of your students. 
Where are they at? What are they doing? Um, the other thing each of you can do, grad students on up, is give informal talks of how you got into science. Right, you are a 4.0 unicorn alien uh, to most undergrads and underrepresented students. You've got a vibrant Sockness chapter. How many of you have spoke to the Sockness group about your research and journey in science? Yeah, so that's cool. You've got, a, you've got some other folks you can do this, and it doesn't have to be you know, just here at maybe K through 12, or you find a, a population where you can kind of demystify some of this stuff. Decolonize your syllabus, and you could do this all in one fell swoop if you want to be work hard once. But if you know, just be pragmatic on one level. Add three or four examples. Your textbooks are not well representing the history. You might have the history, but it's not. It's whose history? That's one other. We'll get into the weeds there. But this has to be something you can easily fix. And you know, this is a manuscript that came out within the last year or two. Uh, Amelia Huerta and Rory Rolfs, I know a little bit. Um, I don't know the other folks, but again, some theoretical pop gen things where some people have provided some history of some other examples. All right, if you want traditional ecological knowledge examples, I got them up the wazoo. And I don't have a, I'm not an expert on this. How many of you saw the coyote badger viral video in the last few days? Yeah. All right, a very famous Jerry Coyne, not the nicest person of a on reputation, never met the man, said on Twitter, who knew? It's like, every tribe that has lived where badgers and coyotes have known this story for, gen for hundreds and hundreds of years. This is common knowledge. We call them brothers, okay? So yeah, Western science has documented that this actually, they do hunt more successfully when they're together, but this is old hat for a community. Bringing salmon bones back into a stream it's part of a reinc reincarnation story. All right, well, what do we start doing nitrogen? If we want to retrieve us, recover a riparian zone before the salmon are returned, they're putting salmon carcasses in because the nitrogen gets on 100 meters of each side of the, the creek. So these are examples that you can throw out there of people knowing things. Um, I think you guys already do a version of this. You guys? <laughs> All right, I'm working on it. Struggling. Um, and I, th I think you have a program within your institution to bring in postdocs and maybe do opportunity hires. Um, so continue that. Make sure they're underrepresented here in the US. Um, this study is a pretty good example of kind of one way you can do a general faculty search. This Montana State, they had a challenge of in mostly in engineering and the hard sciences where they would offer jobs to women to come move to Bozeman, Montana, about two hours from where I grew up, and they would turn down the job. And they used their advance grant to do this example, and they've had 33 hires since and 17 females have accepted. So this little process, which was train faculty reviewers on implicit bias. All right, everybody does that. Before you, you know, the reason implicit bias has a short window under which it, it you'll you'll get rid of some of your basic biases. So you do that just before you review applications. Two, then you start beating the brush, finding where these applicants are. Um, and then three, this is the cool part, is they bring in another female or man with with family in the area that they're going to be completely independent of the job search. The, job candidate or the committee and department aren't going to know who this person is and they can talk and ask questions you can't ask during your job interviews so what's it like to have kids and what are the schools like what's it like to x y and z how's housing prices you can get some of that but other things about personal things you can't ask in a job interview nor should they ask you and so this is a way to kind of get around that so you can get the information of what it's like to live in bozeman montana just kind of a lovely place, but expensive. For anyways. anybody been to Bozeman? Yeah, a few. All right. All right. So, if you don't have enough minority faculty, hire them. And I'll show you an example. There's one field that actually has a good representative pool. I realize ecology evolution. We've got work to do to build up the pool of first-gen, low-income, and minority students. 
and people with disabilities, and we need that broad definition. But the molecular cell biology field does not have a leg to stand on. And Kenny Gibbs did this research. If two-thirds of the medical schools that are doing research hired one minority faculty a year for six years, the diversity problem is solved. So one tenure cycle. And this is, the, who's that pool? I'm part of this study, but I'm not in the pool because I didn't publish well enough and didn't have grants. So this is who's actually what we would consider R1 eligible fac, uh, postdocs. So the one field where we can actually say, hey, we've got people of color, and you're not hiring them. And so this has to be something we have to be cognizant of. Kenny Gibbs works at NIH now, and he's a program officer. He does really cool work. I know him through Sockness, and um, he's some of the innovative stuff you're seeing out of NIH related to how grants are being dealt with and these other issues. He's part of. When you do bring in diverse faculty, the standard don't death them by, commu by committee. This is where your department chair has to be strong to protect your people of color, particularly. Um, on these issues. There's pressures to serve on committees before your tenure. There's also, you end up doing a lot of service work as this paper laid out in the last year and a half. Native students find me. There's only about 100 on, at Iowa State. I don't know anything about history, but I've advised history, Native American students, about how to navigate, because they find me. Is that part of my job description? No. And this undocumented labor is being done, particularly if you're a woman in some of these STEM fields, all the women grad students are going to come find you, or the undergrads are. So if you're going to hire somebody from these populations, then build in 10% of their time around this service that's going to get done. So that when tenure comes up, this becomes part of that conversation, this work. Because they're doing a lot that's not being documented or being rewarded at this point. Teaching evaluations, just because they come up often, they're heavily biased against women, minorities, and people with accents. Um, and there's a lot of papers on that. And uh, a recent paper done by at Iowa State actually showed that if you taught, told the students about this bias, it eliminates the bias in the evaluations. Um, it's not a beautiful study. The authors are friends of mine, and they're like, it's not great. I mean, it's, replication problems, and I've, but it's a kind of a nice example of some of these things. And there is a bunch of EEB literature out there about kind of some of these issues. You know, men don't cite women as frequently, things like that. So if you're going to use impact factor, which is a garbage metrics, I know it's kind of a sensitive point for EEB folks because I've been on panels where it's a bunch of molecular and cell biologists who say, biology letters has no impact factors. It's a great journal for an undergrad to have a paper in that journal in, our, in my field. But that kind of conversation you're going to have to have. And if you're using this higher, if higher level folks are using this, then that's, we have to fight against that. All right, I don't have talk, time to talk about natural history museums, but if you want to ask questions, it's fine. Uh, career decisions, um, all this, the summary of the, some of this research on career decisions is you can look and talk to really highly accomplished scientists of color, and they say why, I'm, why I left or why I'm not in it. And it's the quote that I paraphrase is, I can hang with these people, I just don't want to hang with these people. And so that is a good summary of some of Kenny Gibbs' other research that him and Kelly, uh, Kimberly Griffith have done. How many of you are familiar with the Meyerhoff Scholars Program? So this is kind of the boutique, high-profile program it's, if, if I'm saying it's the expensive version of my program, if I'm being selfish or arrogant, I'm trying to not be, but Meyerhoff is a pretty amazing program, and it came out of UMBC, and it's now been adapted at Penn State and UNC. And they take about 40 students from underrepresented groups, typically minorities, and they boot camp them through an undergrad program. And it's kind of, if you meet a Meyerhoff scholar, they're accomplished. I mean. They give you the right handshake, the eye contact. Um, they publish well. Um, they're they're kind of maniacs. And, and would that work with native people? No. Making direct eye contact is a problem for me. I have to professionally think about making eye contact because that's rude as hell to do that in my community. Um, 
So Bayer Hoff costs about $40,000 per year per student, and they fund about 40 to 50 students. It's crazy expensive, um, and there are now uh, Zuckerberg's paying for a, a chunk of it to happen at UC Berkeley, even though UC Berkeley has a program called the Biology Scholars Program with 500 biology students and 3,000 alumni that cost $2,000 per year per student. So you think about what that money could do if you scaled up biology scholars program. But it's not a sexy, high profile kind of program. Look, I know I'm at an elite institution. Meyerhoff is gonna come here. But if you want bang for your buck, that would rip me off. All right, any questions? Thank you. And I'd just like to thank Lisa Walsh for basically blowing her whole day and part of her night last night, shuttling me around, so thank you. Undocumented labor, yeah. I just wondered if you could take a second to say your two-second summary of what you were going to say about natural history. Yeah. So the question was about, just so the audio, I'm going to repeat the question. So the question was about, what would I say about natural history museums? You know, curators never leave. They die with, they they die and they die and then they get pinned in the you know pinned in the back and there you're in for life. Um, so that's a bit of that challenge. Uh, museums tend to be about 80% white, if not and male. We also have a general challenge of that cultural baggage of museums being hostile places. Some of the eugenics history still rings true for other people of color, um, and unfortunately. The mammal, the museum collection here went from campus to five miles away. All right, how many grad students have set foot in that building? Okay, a lot of you have. Damn. <laughs> you just undermined my whole argument. No. When they moved the collection at Kansas during my postdoc to, you know, in the three years I was there, I was in there six times. Because we took the shelves that of the specimens I needed and they were right outside my office. But if I wanted to do show and tell with students, you know, it was two different trips, or it was, it was kind of a pain in the butt. So we have a challenge with people not valuing specimen-based research. You know, you, you, everybody who's teaching ologies knows you don't get to do hardly anything with students handling live organisms anymore. You know, it's powerful to be able to hold a live rat or a mouse. You know, with hantavirus, no one's allowed to do that. You know, you got to wear a space suit. So these kind of challenges for museums um, continues to be you know, funding and things like that. So how are you going to add more curatorial positions? You know, part of my talk at University of Kansas was I chastised them, because Kansas at one time in the 90s had two curators and a collection manager. And for the last 15 years, they've had, well, I should say last 10 years, they've had zero curators and a part-time collection manager. University of Kansas Mammal Collection was in top five in the globe when I left in the 90s. So the priorities have changed, and there's a, some more political reasons why the director never replaced the mammologist, but that's a whole other story for another day. Um, but the, that evolution is, you've seen this really important collection. If you want to work in Latin American, South American mammals, you have to go to Kansas. But that collection's effectively fallow and has been for 10 years. And so things of these values or things from, from museums are always a, a difficult challenge. And what's your entry level for getting behind the scenes to actually do specimen touching? So Berkeley had this, a lot of pre-meds liked it because it was bone numbering and cleaning and muscle identification. And that's how you started at the basement of the MVZ and worked your way up. It wasn't a beautiful program, but it was solid. And a version of that could be replicated here. And that might be how you start bringing people in. You know, there was a lot of students at Berkeley who taking all the intro bio classes on the first floor and didn't know the MBZ even existed, which was on floor two. So again, it's not a public museum, so there's some challenges there. But anyways, that's a rambling answer. I didn't give you the two-second version. So yes. So the, the general tenor of this uh, sounds like, I'm speaking in particular with respect to underrepresented minorities, 
a way of doing things in regards to science. I'm just wondering if you bump up against some of the criticisms from other yep. cultures that there are different ways of doing and knowing and doing yes. that might put different spin on this process? Very much so. So the question was related to um, my talk being kind of very a simulation framing, and I agree with what I presented to you for sure. Um, as a native, yeah, this is a big issue. Um, I literally was at a nation-building conference at Idaho last week where it was scientists, lawyers, and we all talking about ac academia and things like that. So the framing of how you do you know, Western science, how I taught it at Haskell Indian Nations University, I would wear a baseball hat to that lecture every year and say, all right, I'm gonna put my Western science hat on. It has really restricted values about how, what I can see and what I can do and we'll call it Western science. Are there other ways to know? Sure. If I'm using it over here and over here, it's not Western science. So that's kind of a partial answer, but there are natives in particular that don't buy Western science and think it's garbage. And there's some bad beliefs in Indian country, I would argue, as well. So there's a lot of natives don't buy the Bering Land Bridge or evolution. Some of that has to do with a guy named Vine Deloria Jr. who wrote some pretty excellent critiques of Western science in the 60s and 70s. But towards the end of his life, he basically made it, wrote a book that was arguing for catastrophism, driving all of evolutionary history in the young earth, basically. So he was a young earth creationist who just happened to be a native version of this. So there's native fundamentalism. Now, I've actually written, presented on this, I, haven't, I need to turn this into a paper, but why natives don't buy that? There's some arguments for why they do, why they don't. Some of it is you get attacked to being another immigrant here in North America, in Turtle Island, by conservatives who are, I mean, there's a tax on tribal sovereignty happening all the time, right now. Indian Child Welfare Act, that's a big thing right now. That's why Elizabeth Warren hit a nerve. She attacked tribal sovereignty with her misuse of genomics to, to make that argument. So that's why I was frustrated with her and how she'd been told eight years ago, don't do this, don't do this. And she did, because she took the, the bait. And look, I still would love her as a president. Totally would. She's got a really nice plan for natives. She does. Has she apologized appropriately? Hell no. But that's a different animal, all right? I'm not looking for perfect. I'm looking for someone who's trainable and willing to learn. So, um, yeah. So what you critiqued is a fair critique about what I'm mostly what I'm going to present. So, yeah. What do I consider trainable? And willing to learn. And willing to learn. I mean, you are all faculty and scientists. You are trainable, you know. Um, Sanger sequencing is no longer used, you know, for, so we learn new techniques and, and how to do this. I know you're probably better about talking about diversity, equity, inclusion than you were 10 years ago, right? When I was a grad student, we didn't talk about any of this shit, sorry. But we didn't talk about this, not in a serious way. Certainly I didn't talk with, with you know, other minority students in my lab, we did. The two labs I've been in at Kansas and University of Washington, by far the most diverse labs. That's by the value of that individual faculty in a direct admit program. So, yeah, the only African American in my lab. One of the few Latinos in my lab. Obviously, I was the only native in my program, but that, you know, I've got white male privilege again. I want to reiterate that point. So I don't have to deal with some of the same bullshit that they had to. I get to walk through life without having to deal with this. Not in a serious way. Not in the same way, anyways. I deal with it in other serious ways, but that's a whole other, well, anyways, yeah. I'll give you, yeah. So I, I thought this was a direction you were going. The other question, the other question was about cultural assimilation. Mm -hmm. Yes.
Sure. So the question was related to training I do with students as far as assimilation related to some of these soft skills things. If you take a leadership training program anywhere in this country, they're going to say, you need to make eye contact and have a good firm handshake. Well, if you're Asian, that may not work for you culturally. If you're native, I look at people's chins. That's not necessarily a good thing because there's other things lower than there that I'm not staring at, but that, you know. <laughs> and I'm also missing IQ sometimes. So I had to really consciously work on that. Now, a business person will say, if you don't make direct eye contact, then you are shifty. So, oh, you're not as interested. So you might have a native kid talking, you might be talking to them about your research, they're whole hog into it, but they're looking down. So you're not seeing any cues that they're really into limnology. So that's where I'm talking about. So I just want them to know that you can be in these settings, and these are things you can work on or educate folks about some of these things. So I'm kind of giving you a half answer, but yeah. I want students to be empowered to have, look, I'm cocky. I would say if I took all my students into the field, I'll turn them into ecologists or evolutionary biologists. I think each one of you probably thinks that too. Go show them your system. Show them your passion. I suck them in. Yeah. There's a photo, one of the photos of a student who's terrified of mice holding a California mouse. You know, that took about an eight-step process of not dragging direct eye contact with the rodent, you know, fear, and she overcame it. Now, did she start working on mammals? No, she's a she's a pre-med student, so she's a med student. But um, but those kinds of things, I'm not going to force completely my biases, or at least not knowingly what my biases are. Because I have them. You know, I light up when a student sits across me and tells me I want to do conservation or biodiversity work. It's like, oh, sweet. I know so many places to go. I know some places to stay, to stay away, some toxic individuals in my discipline. I can give them that information. I get an engineering student across from me, I can get them into, to ready for grad school. But I can't give them, hey, you better watch out for Dr. So-and-so, or that department has a really crappy reputation. So those kinds of things is what I'm rambling about. Yeah. There seems to be a, what can universities do better from that standpoint? Is there a training that should be going for? Is there currently not? Should those trainings be at the grad level? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question was what can universities do to kind of help with some of this cultural competency across cultures um, around these settings? In invite people like me. You know, how many of you knew that Navajo, Hopi folks, can't be around dead things. Yeah, see one hand, a couple two. Yeah. All right, now you know. Navajos are everywhere. Diné people are everywhere. It's the most common native around there running around. They're here. They're here on this campus. I've met them today. So if you've got that student, think about what that might mean. There's some natives that seeing an owl is a harbinger for death. I've got a native student I just met at Idaho. She's going to do a PhD on owls. Okay, it's not uniform. We're talking 572 tribal nations that are recognized. That's not even getting the ones that are state acknowledged or other groups that aren't federally acknowledged, but there are natives. So we're not one group as in anybody else. And so some cultures have different taboos around different things. And just be open to that possibility with your students. Um, it's not a nice clean answer because I don't think there is a clean answer for it. Yeah. Hannah's got a question. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just calling out Hannah. Yeah. Hannah and I were housemates for a year in Kansas so before she left Kansas for greener pastures, pastures for her PhD. Any last questions? Thank you for your time.